My name's Art Toy. I used to work at Pfizer for almost 25 years. I was given a package, not offered a package, over six years ago. And some like-minded friends of mine, we got together and started a company. And we've been installing renewables since. And Maynard asked me to give a talk today, not so much about the technology, but the economics. Dollars and cents here. Because he'd be pricing the technology over and over again. So he wanted me to give you some real-world numbers and costing and payback. So though I'm not trained as an MBA, I'm trained as a chemist, per se, when I worked at Upjohn. This has been a passion of mine since I was in college here. So we're going to talk about various systems. Here's a, a spreadsheet that I obtained from the Energy Information Administration, part of the Department of Energy. It lists the re, uh, residential rates in Michigan for electricity in kilowatt hours from 1990 to 2013. I didn't have a chance to put 2014 because it's only a partial year, but as a partial year, 2014 is 15.2 cents a kilowatt hour on average. Okay. So if you'll see, uh, rate changes have fluctuated all over the place. Last several years, it's been averaging around 6%. But back in the late 90s, early 21st century, it actually went backwards in some places. A lot of that had to do with uh, uh, deregulation choices. And at first, the low cost of natural gas, but then it started to go up due to shortages. So many factors came into the mix here. So just to give you a sense of what has happened since 1990, it's almost doubled. So when people ask me, what is the rate of return on these systems, I've been typically using 4% fixed rate of inflation for rise in retail rates of electricity. So based on that, some of the systems that we've been installing have a ROI, or return on investment, of approximately nine to 10 years. Before that, oh, six, seven years ago, return on investments for solar was well over 25 years. Solar panels have dropped by well over 80% in cost in six years. Many things have been driven that by that. Um, most of the panels available now are made in China, though the panels we've installed typically come from either from U.S. or non-Chinese companies because the clients have asked us for that sourcing. Okay. Um, can't really comment since I haven't had any personal experience with installing Chinese-made panels. Richard, do you have any? I, I can't really comment on it. World standard. Yeah, yeah. They all have the same. C E U L. Yeah, they all have. So, but uh, a lot of the government projects I'm working on require U.S. U.S. contracts. Um, this summer, I will be. Our company will be installing the largest solar array, array in West Michigan for the Army. It's part of their 25 by 25 initiative of having at various. Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps facilities of producing on site 25% of their electrical load by 2025. This site that we'll be installing at will provide offset approximately 13% of annual electrical uses. So, but that project, all of them for the DOD have required US made content as far as solar panels and inverters. They also require uh, prevailing wages as well. Uh, pretty much all of our energy from renewables, in one form or another, is derived from the sun, whether it's wind or solar, because the air movement of the air is dependent upon the t differences in temperature variations, which causes <coughs> the movement of the air. So here's two real world examples. If I were to install a 10 kilowatt Bergy wind turbine, and I choose wind uh, Bergy because they've been around for well over 35 years. There are a plethora of wind turbine manufacturers who come and go over the years. And basically we've avoided using those unless a company's been around for over five years or longer. 
when is a very unforgiving environment. If you aren't willing to develop a, and manufacture wind turbine that can survive Mount Washington, it just isn't going to cut it over a lifespan of 20, 25 years. The example I'm going to use here is a Verde wind turbine on a 160-foot self-sustaining tower with no guide wires um, in, South, in the South Haven area. I'm using South Haven is that as a wind resource, it's an excellent wind resource. If you were to go on the Michigan Energy Office, they have lists of wind resources for various heights of 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, 400 feet. For that system, it'll on average generate oh, almost 18,000 kilowatt hours a year. And you've pretty much heard that phrase, kilowatt hours. I bet you're just raring to go home and look at your electric bill to see what you've been using over the last year. If you do, they'll give you a sense of what that kind of system would cost. If someone were to want something like that, I would probably <coughs> charge them about $135,000. There's a lot to go into. The turbine itself is going to run about $33,000 with shipping. The tower, another $33,000. There's geotechnical. I won't do any kind of excavation until I take soil borings and determine what kind of soil type there is. That will determine the type of concrete, amount of concrete, depth of concrete, amount of rebar to use because essentially you have this gigantic moment arm. That chunk of concrete is what's keeping the tower from falling over when there's a lateral loading 100 feet, 200 feet up in the air. As well as labor, permits, interconnection fees, and labor, and wires, and trenching, and backfillings. So after a 30% tax credit, and that tax credit ends 31 December 2016, just so get that on your radar. After a tax credit, it's still $94,500. I'm not going to even give you the ROI on that one. As a comparison, if, we're, if I were to install a 12 kilowatt ground mounted solar system in South Haven, that is approximately 48 solar panels, 40 inches by 66 inches, 250 watts a piece, set on the ground, doesn't track, just fixed at a of angle 30 degrees from horizontal, I'm expected that that would produce about 15,000 kilowatt hours a year. That system will run a client approximately $40,000, and after a tax credit, you're down to about $28,000. The payback, if it's a residential system, is for uh, nine years. If it's a commercial system, it's from somewhere between four and six, using standard depreciation. There used to be, and it just expired last year, a 50% accelerated depreciation for a residential system. This isn't any kind of special tax break for solar. If it's any kind of commercial operation, whatever kind of equipment you're purchasing that you use capital for, you can use standard depreciation on it. So, and these paybacks are based on assuming a 4% rate of inflation for electricity. So if you saw that chart I showed you earlier, you have rates of uh, changes of over 6% in some cases. So this gives you a sense. I have not installed wind in over four, almost four years now. I'm, one, I'm, on, I'm the only NABSEP, North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioner, uh, rated certified wind installer in Michigan, and there are only 12 of us in the nation. Yet even that, when, it, when I'll get a phone call saying, I've got a great wind site, I'll do, get their address, and I'll do a virtual Google Earth flyover to site, look it over, and use the wind charts as well, and using um, weather data to calculate the site. And invariably, I'll give them a, a proposal, and also, I'll take out the solar. Can you see why I haven't installed solar wind in over four years? So, you know, you want it. But sometimes, it, oh, solar is so ugly. I love wind. Well, okay. I, I, I can't comment on the aesthetics of this because it's, it's in the eye of the client. So but here, here are the two proposals. So, now, I'm only addressing small wind. Small wind typically being 150 kilowatt size or smaller. <coughs> 
Oh, yes. What size blade are we talking about? This, for this one, it's 23 feet in diameter. Okay. And when we talk about utility scale wind, the blades you see going down I-94, those blades actually are going up to a wind farm up in the thumb area for a wind farm for DT. <coughs> for a utility scale wind, it is actually more cost competitive than solar. There is a crossover point from where solar is less competitive with wind. It also depends on the site. <coughs> wind is not linear. You can actually build a taller tower, greater blades, using almost the same footprint. Solar is pretty much linear. More solar, more land, more wire. Okay. So around about the 800 kilowatt size solar, then wind then becomes more cost competitive. But it also depends on the area, what kind of infrastructure you see. That's why you'll see the wind farms going up in Thumb and in the Levington area. Those sites are okay for wind. They're not great, but they're, they're decent. But what's driving it is the economics of the infrastructure, the high tension lines there. What makes Ludington a great site is because of the Ludington pumping station. I don't have a prize, but can anyone tell me why Ludington pumping station was ever developed? They were building the water plant over in Midland, and when they shut down the refuel, it wasn't supposed to get in. That, that's part of it. Ludington pumping station, which is quite unique in the country, was put in because of three things. Palisades, Cook, and Fermi 2. Maybe Fermi 3 someday. I don't know. What happens, at nighttime, the base load in the area isn't great enough to absorb the power generated by these three nuclear power plants. You cannot ramp down the, the core to a point where the, it lessens the, the, the amount of power it generates. It literally takes months to ramp it up and ramp it down. So where do you send that power to? You pump water up to the dam there at night when the load is less. And Ludington gets a, gets a nice break. They let that water run back down, spins the turbines which is also makes it an excellent site for putting up utility scale wind. When, say, when people say, oh, you can't store that power, well, here's a huge battery here at the Ludington pumping station for the wind farms to feed them. So it's a very unique resource we have in Michigan. So just a bit of trivia if everyone asks about Ludington. <laughs> So basically, we were all, I was also asked to give you a quick rundown on what net metering is. Net metering is actually an agreement, interconnection between you and the electrical utility, whereby uh, you are given permission to use some sort of renewable energy system, in this case, wind or solar. It gets sent to your load center or your main breaker. If you're using power, you can pull some of that power into the house. Anything you don't use excess goes through the meter where uh, the old time mechanical meter, it's been backwards. So if it's digital, it will record what you send into the grid where you get a credit. You don't get paid, no money transpires. But when I fill out a form to install a system for your site, I have to list <coughs> historically what you or this site uses in electrical power. And that is my upper limit in designing a system. For example, if historically the house uses 12,000 kilowatt hours in a year, I'm limited to design in a system that will generate 12,000 kilowatt hours a year. Now, they'll give you 5 to 10% leeway because um, the solar or the wind varies from year to year, and as well as your use varies a little bit year to year. So this is a, you're entering into a contract where the utility will then allow you to put in a renewable energy system at your site. Okay. <clears throat> this is just gives you an example for when what's involved. Uh, this type of tower, a guide lattice, uses is far less expensive than a self-supporting, but it also requires a great deal of wires, which takes up a great deal of acreage. It doesn't even require as much excavation or concrete but it takes up more space. 
You got the tilt out. Now, we are, we still believe that there is a place for wind for off grid systems, as Maynard would say. We feel that for to be off grid, you should have a, a hybrid system that's composed of both wind and solar. And in that case, it's, it's good that you are able to raise and lower the tower, and do maintenance. Um, I, I climb towers. I charge $1,200 the moment my feet leave the ground because I want to come home to my family. So I will go very slow. We have a policy of 100% tie-off at all times. I will not allow free climbing. I find a crew member free climbing, they're fired. Okay. So what happens? You hook, you climb, you unhook, hook, unhook, you climb. It's very slow going. And when you get up to the nacelle, I service the wind turbine over in Jackson, open up the nacelle, and a hornet, a yellow jacket. <laughs> so that's why I carry a can of spray. <laughs> Don't want that. And also found a bird's nest in there, too. So it's still operational, but boy, was there a lot of stuff in there. So that's another type of tower that you can raise and lower. So there is a place for wind here. And this is what the type of tower that's self-supporting, no wires, but a huge amount of concrete and rebar. Rebar, concrete, one inch rebar, um, six inch on center. Huge cage of steel as well. Here's a graphic example. This is at my home. I also have solar. Uh, it gives. I, I've been data logging since February of 2011 up to February 2014. You can see the seasonal variations. Uh, highs in the summertime, lows in the wintertime, December, December, December. Uh, I, I have a contract with Consumers Energy, which is a feed-in tariff program that pays me uh, 53 cents a kilowatt hour on a 12-year contract. That program doesn't exist anymore. And apparently it was very... Uh, a lot of people wanted into it. So there was a lottery of ping pong balls where they picked it out. So, so that's been fully subscribed. But what happens though, if this was uh, a net metering system, basically you think of it as a checking account. You deposit all summer long, and then you can withdraw during the summer, uh, winter time when you produce less. So on an annual basis, you want to if your budget allows to design a system that it generates as much energy as you would have used. So this peak here was from two summers ago when we had the drought, when we had June, a very dry June, very little rain. That was my best month for electrical production. Our, our Junes are typically hazy and rainy. So uh, three summers ago, last summer, it was more typical of the production. So when I tell people I'll give them a, a projected output, it's based on some averages. As you can see, there are seasonal variations. So the basic makeup of these systems is you have a solar array. Uh, the electrical code requires a DC connect, disconnect to isolate the system. You have the inverter, which converts the DC, much like a battery, into AC that you get from the grid. You have an AC disconnect that can isolate the inverter for maintenance. This meter used to be required. It isn't required anymore. It goes to your panel with all your breakers up to a certain size. After a certain size, we have to bypass that breaker and have its own separate uh, load center. Power goes in the house if it's needed, otherwise exit goes into the utility, utility meter and up. And most likely it only gets as far as your neighbor, in which case they use it. Okay. Now it's a system. Um, when we get a, a request for solar, and they, they invariably ask us for a tracker because it looks pretty cool, it moves. I'll show them a price list again. 
Uh, for Tracker, right now it's running about $3, $3.25 a watt. If we were to ground mount them, no tracking, fixed angle, then it's running about $0.80 cents a watt. So you get about 40% more power by tracking, but you're paying three times more for the system to mount it on. So this system here is over in Shelbyville. It's with the Gun Lake Tribe. They chose, we gave them it. They want it, they still want it to track it. So it's based on what the client wants. We told them what the, uh, what the economics were, but they still want it to track it. Typically, we would ground mount them here on the, on, at a fixed angle. We'll run about, about 80 cents a watt versus tracking around $3.25 <coughs> a watt. I used to think of, of individual component size, but after a while, you just start thinking this part is how many cents a watt, and this part is how many cents a watt, and, that, and you add them all up, and you get a really quick back of the envelope calculation that way here. Um, we are not proponents of roof mounts of solar, especially snow climates. We do, we have mounted in, in, on roofs simply because of the neighborhood. The yard doesn't have the space for ground mount. And we tell the client that pretty much if you do roof mount it, there the likelihood that your system will be offline between Thanksgiving and Valentine's, well this year maybe Easter. <laughs> um, so uh, and we will never tell you to go on the roof to brush off snow. Anybody that tells you, you got to, no, we will never tell you to go. The reason for ground mounting, you take a broom, soft bristle, some sort of brush the snow off the panels there. Examples of what not to do. Essentially, um, the, cell, the cells are wired in series, so think of every cell here, these little squares, as a battery. And if you shade them, it's essentially short circuits of the system, and it really degrades the system. It can drop down to about 5, 10, 20 percent of what it would be in full sun. We did not do that. <laughs> um, there is a place for storage batteries. We also get requests for backup power. And as, as, as a policy, our company has been advising, if your outages are typically a week or less annually, we really don't recommend batteries for backup power because unless you're willing to make that battery bank your second best friend, your spouse being your best friend, <laughs> if you aren't willing to do that, why don't you just give me $20,000 and I'll burn it. I'll just burn it up. <laughs> because if you aren't willing, Maynard, you know, you do a good job. You got those to last over 10 years. If you aren't willing to maintain those batteries, you've just wasted a lot of money. So our recommendation, if you, if you still want backup power, to either go with natural gas or propane fire generators for backup power. But for off-grids, yeah, you definitely are going to need batteries. Right. Essentially how a battery-based system works on grid, the solar panel goes through a charge controller, maintains the charge of the battery so the solar panel doesn't cook the battery and dry it out. The inverter pulls from the battery. It feeds either the main panel or your critical loads panel. When the grid goes down, the inverter isolates and prevents sending power into the grid, sends power to your critical loads so that you can still run your refrigerator, your freezer, your wells, um, some your internet access. Um, this is essentially the system I have at my home for backup power, schematic-wise. It's, it's fairly complicated as far as hardware is concerned. Okay. So, Things to ask yourselves, um, you know, why, why are you going on solar or renewables? And what, what are the shade issues in the area? Typically what we would like to see on a site 
is a site that is in full sunlight, no shading whatsoever between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Based on that, I can pretty much give you a really good plus or minus 15% what your annual production of solar should be. Okay. People ask me, oh, oh, I can add, put it on my roof, my shingles, it'll make them last longer. And I look at it and I think, looks like you're ready for a new shingle in the next few years. So if you really want it on your roof, you're going to have to take it off re-shingle and put it back on. So think about that because if you truly do want it, you got to consider when you, do you plan to re-shingle your roof. How far can the array be from your house? Typically if it's ground mounted, I like to keep it no more than 300 feet to keep the wire size manageable. We try to design our system to maintain a, a line loss of 1% or less. Now, the, it was also asked that I talk about wa heating water. For off-grid, solar thermal makes sense. Okay. You're using the sun to heat, using either flat plates or evacuated tubes to heat water. But if you're grid connected, we started making this recommendation in the last 18 months. We've seen air-to-air -air heat exchange water heat. What they are is essentially it's a heat pump that uses the air around it to heat the water. And we found that these are twice as efficient as electric resistant water heat. We prefer this for heating water, not hydronic heating, solar thermal, there's a place for that for hydronic heating. But if for regular domestic hot water use, we are recommending using an air-to-air -air heat pump, water heater, and solar electric. The reason being, with solar thermal, on a sunny day, you warm up that water and either you use it within 24 to 48 hours or it just cools off. There's really no way of, of banking that or, or using it for months down the road. <coughs> using a combination of solar electric and an air to air heat pump, the solar uses the utility as a checking account where you build up a credit throughout the year or summer and you, you can use that electricity and pull it back when you don't have that resource. So that's a way of using solar electricity and the utility to help keep water. We've only started making that recommendation in the last 18 months simply because the cost of these systems have dropped quite a bit. Correct. It acts as a kind of a mini air conditioner in the summertime. And with that, I think I covered the topics you wanted me to speak to.